Good afternoon or good morning to everybody. My name is Andrew Skubilius. I am a member for Open Parliament, Standing Rapporteur on Russia, and also initiator of the Forum of the Friends of European Russia. So, and I am very happy to welcome you to 17th seminar of our forum during this year. So, yeah, it was quite an intensive year here in European Parliament. We had a special Russia report. We had six or seven Russia resolutions. I even uh, not able to calculate all of them. And we have, of course, Sakharov Award to Navalny. And as I mentioned before, 17 seminars of our forum. This is the last seminar for this year, but we shall continue next year. And really, we are happy that our seminars are becoming quite popular. Today, we have more than 200 uh, registered participants, and, and everybody is is able to watch also direct, uh, directly on, on, on Facebook. Uh, and of course, we are happy of this, uh, what I call informal coalition of like-minded people and of new cooperations and, and collaborations with different organizations and think tanks, which we are able to build up. And that is why I would like to thank very much, you know, Chatham House, Russia and Eurasia program. We have really very, very important and very valuable cooperation. And this is the second event uh, during this year, which we're doing together with Chatham House. The first one on myths and misconceptions in the debate on Russia we had in September. And, uh, and uh, really, mm, uh, uh, those who would like uh, can find that seminar. It was a very interesting seminar. Can find it on our Facebook again. Now we have the second seminar on Chatham House research paper produced by K.R. Giles. We're happy that we have him today. The paper was produced in September and paper has very important title, uh, Who, uh, What Deters Russia? And During Principles for Responding to Moscow. And I, when I read it in September, I immediately said to my, to my collaborators, to my team that we need to have this seminar. But uh, different circumstances allowed us to have seminar uh, only now. And perhaps it's not bad uh, since now we know perfectly well why we need to deter Russia. And the question is how to do it and not only how to de deter militarily, but also how to deter geopolitical Kremlin blackmail. I will not, uh, I will not uh, speak too much about uh, the research paper itself, which Kerr Giles will present very soon. But I would simply confess that while reading the paper, I was envying that it's written not by me. You know, since all my thoughts and conclusions, uh, you know, intuitive, you know, uh, I found in this paper. And allow me to read just uh, one or two sentences from concluding chapter, which I think it's really an essence of at least from my point of view, essence of the whole paper. And the quotation is like this. Nevertheless, some European leaders continue to signal that the greatest concern is not defeat, but war itself. By broadcasting this fear and repeatedly announcing what they will not do to protect the license, instead of what, what they will, they invite President Putin to manipulate their fears and thus sow the seeds of further aggression and armed conflict in the future. End of quotation. So this seminar really is about how to deter fear from Western community, I would say so. So that's my introduction. Now I am very happy to give the floor to James Nixie, Director, Russia Eurasia Program, Chatham House. James, please, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much indeed, Andreas. That's very kind of you. <clears throat> it's nice to be invited back and uh, shows perhaps that Chatham House didn't, didn't totally disgrace itself when we spoke about that myths and misconceptions paper back in September, uh, as you said. Um, <clears throat> the very last part of that paper, of course, was entitled, What Can Be Done? A little bit Leninist, perhaps. Um, but today, of course, we have an entire uh, paper just on that last part. What is it that deters Russia? And obviously, obviously, nothing could be, could be more relevant. I suppose <laughs> I've always felt that one of the great privileges of working in independent think tanks is the, the freedom we enjoy to investigate or, or highlight the issues or, or, or the travesties that we deem to be of the greatest importance. And with Russia basically issuing what looks suspiciously like an ultimatum to me, then this could hardly be more relevant, of course. Um, so what my, my colleague Keir, Keir Giles is going to do now <clears throat> is rather than just praise his paper, which I must say is, 
unparalleled in its directness, in its clarity, and most importantly, in its in its empirical basis. Um, is Keir's going to kind of apply the lessons from that paper, the principles and the conclusions of it, to the current standoff we see? Um, <clears throat> and that's really all I want to say, actually. Um, I want to thank you again, and Andreas and, uh, and, and Mante, for, for, for making us work right up until the Christmas week. No, no, just kidding. I mean, for, for having the foresight to, to, to really allow us to do this with you at, at just, just the right time. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you very much again, and over to you, Keir. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, James. Really, that's, that's for introduction. Now we are moving into, into, into presentation. Before that, just some housekeeping you know, rules. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, questions only in written in the chat. And uh, so uh, presentation by, by, by uh, Kero will be around 10 minutes and uh, commentators will have around seven minutes. And then of course, Q&A. Uh, we were supposed to have interpretation to Russian language, but not because of any, you know, uh, Kremlin policy, uh, you know, impact on us, but we lost interpretation for this meeting. So it's only English, sorry <laughs> for everybody. I hope that next time we shall, we shall, uh, we shall again have uh, interpretation. So now, uh, Kier Jails, you know, the also of this very, very interesting, very important paper, please, Lois, to you. Thank you, Andres, and um, thank you, James, as well. Yes, James is quite right. I'm not going to give a dry recap of all of the points that are in the paper, which anybody can read for themselves. It's freely available online. What I'd like to do instead is talk about the way what is happening at the moment illustrates and quite a lot of the time confirms some of the points from that paper. Because what we're seeing at the moment is the culmination of two very long term processes, both of which are bound up with successes and failures of deterrence. And the first of those is Russia and the West speaking two very different deterrent languages, two different grammars of deterrence which stem from two different cultures with no overlap between them and therefore no possibility of a productive conversation. We've seen Russia, it thinks, telling the West what it found unacceptable and threatening consequences, but the messages have not been received and understood, Moscow thinks. If the demands from Russia were not explicitly stated, it just looked like intimidation or irresponsible brinkmanship for no particular reason. And all of that only changes with Vladimir Putin's speech on 18th of November, where he finally sets out the quid pro quo of all of this activity that's happening near Ukraine. Meanwhile, the West has failed in its turn to convince Russia that pushing for what Russia wants will in fact be resisted. That hasn't been put across in terms that are meaningful for Moscow. And the second process that goes along with this is the change in strategic outlook and mindset in Moscow towards a more assertive posture, which is driven more by Russian desired strategic outcomes than by defensive concerns. It's no longer a Russia we're dealing with that was just trying to resist the expansionist threat of, of the US, of Western institutions instead. It's one that's going to decide what it wants and then go ahead and do it and not content with the borders of its influence and power, will try to revise them. And there are two aspects that feed into that, both the capability and the confidence. In capability terms, let's not forget the basic criterion of state Russia. State power for Russia is and always has been military strength, and the term limit for the modernization program was 2020, last year. So Russia may now feel that its relative strength is either optimum or sufficient to transition to that more assertive posture. But more importantly, there's also the confidence, because Russia has had consistent success in previous assertive actions against Western interests. With localized exceptions, deterrence of challenges from Russia has failed, because there have not been countermeasures imposed that outweigh the benefits that Russia sees itself gaining. So now Russia is going on the offensive. And that's all the more dangerous because Russia has learned over the long term and it had it confirmed over the last eight years that aggressive actions are the best way to achieve its objectives. Because those objectives generally aren't recognized or understood or accepted by the West because they're incompatible with Western priorities, interests and also values, causing damage has proved to be the most effective means of getting attention and getting what Russia wants, even if on occasion what it wants is nothing more than summits and dialogue and recognition and respect in that very peculiar Russian sense that doesn't translate into many other languages. So now, 
Russia thinks it can achieve so much more. And hence we see the Christmas list of demands for Western cooperation in extending Russian power westwards. Now, it's been written a lot that uh, Russia cannot really seriously believe that these are acceptable demands, but I wonder about that. Is it possible that Putin and those around him sincerely believe that these demands might be achievable? I think we need to step back and look at Russia's pattern of failing to understand the West and its pattern of consistently believing that the United States can, in fact, direct NATO and direct other countries in the same way that Russia aspires to. We see Russia asking for previous settlements that it thinks worked, Yalta, Congress of Vienna, precedents of victorious great powers that are agreeing on spheres of influence. Now we see those as not compatible with 21st century Europe. But let's not forget that so much else that Russia is doing and thinking to itself and abroad at the moment is also harking back to a previous century, emulating the Soviet Union, a past system that has disappeared into history, we think. Just like the hockey yesterday, where Russia thinks it's appropriate to dress up as the USSR and lose to Finland. Why is that today any more acceptable than Germany sending out a national football team with swastikas on their kit? And yet, this is the separate mindset, this is the parallel reality that we are dealing with. Put all of these trends together and the problem is we can no longer avoid a decision on that basic contradiction between Russia and the West, where Russia demands limits on the sovereignty of its neighbors, a veto on their foreign and security policy choices backed up by the threat of military force. Question is, is this acceptable in 21st century Europe? Is the West willing to abandon the frontline states to Russia, to roll back the borders of free and independent nations, and to consign millions of people to the condition Russia wants its neighbors to be in, undemocratic, impoverished, and dependent on Moscow. If not, the next choice is where and at what cost to put up a stop sign. The trouble is, so far, that has not happened. All of the messaging to Russia that we've seen publicly is all about do not escalate in Ukraine, which is a very different message from the age of empires in Europe is over and therefore you do not have the right to dictate to your neighbors in general what their future is going to be. The point now is responding to these direct threats to Ukraine is one choice. The other choice is dealing with it later and treating all of this as a Ukraine problem, which it is not. It's a cause, not a symptom of the underlying conflict. If we treat it as just a Ukraine problem, that allows Russia to persist in the two key beliefs. One, that it has the rights to demand these things. And second, that military force is the best way to assert them. And Russia believes this because it has not yet been challenged, not only by the direct messaging that explains precisely what the West will defend, but also by a setback that would demonstrate that military power is not the answer. The result of that is Russia is still at the stage of post-imperial drawdown where success is still enjoyed in resisting the rolling back of power. Russia has not yet suffered a defeat, so there is no reason yet to change its mind. But that also means that the choices that are made now will not only determine the future of allies and partners in Europe, but will also shape Russia itself by setting the limits of Russian power, if necessary, by facing them down or by force. Because that is an essential early step that has not yet been taken in the long-term transition of Russia from a frustrated former empire, which is lashing out to try to regain its status into a normal country that can coexist with others, something that Russia at the moment is showing absolutely no desire to become. Now, thinking of the, the treaties, the ultimatums, if you like, nothing in them is acceptable, but the risk is that it may be accepted because, as we heard in Andres's introduction, conflict-averse Western leaders have a track record of enforcing Russia's demands through being terrified of the alternative. And Russia has been hugely successful in promulgating this threat of war escalating to a nuclear level. It's even repeated in the texts of the treaties themselves, this intensive messaging that we see through all of Russia's spokesmen over the past few years. And Russia, again, could be counting on success and at leaving, achieving at least part of these demands because of past consistent European responses to their threats. The sad fact is that there may be no exit from this complete failure to communicate than a trial of strength. 
the only option sooner or later might be bloody and messy and damaging because Russia has chosen to go down the route of aggression, which means others don't have a wide choice of how to respond. You either respond in kind or you surrender. It's normal and it's natural and it's human to hope that there will be a way out of this problem that doesn't involve a fight sooner or later, but it would be highly dangerous to base all decisions on that assumption. At the same time, we get the impression sometimes that the decision on Ukraine has already been made. We hear messaging from the United States about, quote, finding an accommodation with Russia, giving in to some of the Russian demands, and treating Russian demands as an acceptable topic of conversation. And again, you have to ask the question, why? If a criminal family in a neighborhood demands that the rest of the houses around them remove their locks and their alarms and their home insurance, and it's made a no-go zone for the police. Is that something that we negotiate on? And again, we hear this constant advertising that there will be no direct military support to Ukraine. Heard first from the US, now from the United Kingdom. It is baffling why Western leaders do this, regardless of how realistic it might be, regardless of whether we think there might genuinely be some kind of active military support to Ukraine. Why advertise it to Moscow? It encourages Russia, it provides comfort and confidence for Moscow and for President Putin by removing a whole range of worst case scenarios from their planning and their risk calculus, simplifying it hugely by removing that element of uncertainty. And all of these things refer back to the key conclusions that came out from the case studies that we put into the What Deters Russia paper looking at consistent patterns in Russian behavior when Russia is deterred and when it is not. And I'll just repeat to the three that are highlighted most clearly at the moment. Don't say what you will not do to defend yourself and your allies and your partners. Don't self-deter by avoiding meeting challenges. And finally, and most importantly, don't prioritize avoiding or ending conflicts over ensuring that a confrontation arrives at an acceptable outcome. The bottom line, unfortunately, is if the decision is now made not to protect Ukraine against Russia and to face down these demands, the same decision will be faced again when Russia makes its next demands on the next country. Thank you, and I'm greatly looking forward to the discussion. Well, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, really. Uh... I appreciate very much both your paper and, and 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 this presentation. A lot of thoughts and 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 questions and uh, you no know, suggestions how things can 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 be changed on our side. Perhaps will come out. Now I am uh, moving towards our discussion panelists. And first of all, Mrs. Rasa Yuknevich. Yeah? Member of European Parliament from Lithuania, former Defense Minister in my government. Uh, so now, most important I, in your yeah. government. Yes, sure, yeah. of course, not not just you know accidentally. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, and now I share of uh, said a committee subcommittee in European Parliament, but uh, most important vice chair of. Uh, EPP group in Parliament responsible for foreign and security policy. So, Rasa, please, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, first of all. It's my pleasure to take part in, in such uh, uh, important, interesting venue. And of course, very timely. It's exactly what uh, maybe everybody now are discussing, speaking, especially those they are somehow involved in security, defense affairs, and uh, everybody have uh, a lot of questions. Mm, so I will put on the table, first of all, trying to answer myself uh, uh, the answers from the main topic. Uh, two, um, two maybe points. First, uh, what I would like to shortly discuss and to speak first, Nothing provokes the Kremlin more than inaction out of fear of provoking Russia. It's number one. Second, uh, also I would like to, uh, to raise a question which is important one. Can Russians live in democracy? And we have to answer ourselves yes or no. It is very important uh, because the right answer 
uh, on, on this answer, if we will answer rightly, it depends, uh, right strategy. Uh, and of course, uh, our uh, this issue of deterrence. Uh, we are discussing exactly in December, 30 years ago, uh, dissolution of Soviet Union happened and uh, we commemorated this event also in European Parliament. Uh, 30 years ago, I firmly believed that Russia, Ukraine and Belarus, those signatories of uh, of Belovesh uh, Act, Belovesh document, would become democratic uh, European states. It was my firm belief. I remember those, these uh, large demonstrations in Moscow in support of uh, Lithuania at that time, other Baltic nations. So that was for me, uh, for me understandable. But today it's clear uh, that um, for those countries, it was much harder because first of all, because of uh, the communist regime that destroyed nations and people ruled them for 70 years, one generation more than we were in, in such, under the such regime. I mean, Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. Uh, by the way, it is not accidentally that history today is so important for Putin and the Stalinistic narratives are back uh, because my answer is why he is doing this. Because, um, first of all, impunity for the crimes uh, uh, is uh, is uh, also exact. What um, exactly why he he needs uh, he 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 is doing this uh, almost the same today, especially when we see uh, these uh, ultimatums on on the table. Uh, and uh, today we see this relapse, I would say, it's uh, as medical doctor, I can say a relapse of the Soviet Union, not only on the t-shirts of uh, ice hockey players, but it's, 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 we, we, we see this in, 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 in the politics of, uh, of current Russian Federation. And um, mm, I am sure that uh, we will watch developments of second round of collapse of empire. And uh, maybe it's already happening now. Uh, so uh, uh, the beginning of that. So will it be bloody? Will, will it be uh, less painful? I don't know, but, uh, but it will happen for sure. So this is why it's so important to uh, have this right diagnosis uh, on the future of Russia. Will uh, can Russians live in democracy or not? If not, it means that then dialogues with, with the autocrats, uh, uh, dialogue with Putin, dialogue with Kremlin, because it's no other choice, as many Western politicians uh, thinking, thinks until now. But if we believe that Russians can live in democracy, I am among this, those, uh, then we need a totally different strategy and strategy which is, uh, uh, which is, uh, we, 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 we speak about deterrence, deterrence of current regime, but of course strategy, uh, how to uh, help other nations and Russian nation itself to live, uh, to try to have some kind of alternative for their future. And uh, now on this, my first uh, point shortly, about uh, nothing provokes the Kremlin more than inaction out of fear of provoking Russia. Uh, and uh, uh, for me, it's very important point was 2008, when in Bucharest summit, uh, uh, NATO uh, leaders uh, were not able to achieve uh, the decision for NATO membership action plan for Georgia and uh, uh, Ukraine. It was a huge mistake done at that time. And that's why today we see those, uh, those requirements, those, this offensive uh, uh, ultimatums, uh, we see them uh, now against, against, uh, against us. Uh, because uh, this this guy, I would say, this Kremlin leader, he of course wants us to be afraid. 
He wants us to be scared. And when we are scared here because of these offensive attacks, then of course he is trying to achieve what he, uh, he, 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 wants, uh, he wants to achieve. So how to, uh, how to uh, change the attitude, how to change the uh, attitude of, of Western leaders not to be afraid of Putin. Of course, myself, I understand what does it mean nuclear uh, Russian uh, nuclear capabilities, Russian nuclear capabilities. Of course, I understand what does it mean other uh, this military built up next to Ukraine and also around us. But uh, despite that, is no other way just to be firm and not to allow this uh, Kremlin regime to attack us and to use this offensive politics uh, against, against us. So it's opposite what do we need today. We need a NATO membership action plan for Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, we need, we need, uh, we need uh, more sanctions. We need uh, to stop Nord Stream 2. We need very, 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 very strong politics like uh, uh, Western countries had uh, before Soviet Union collapse, uh, which was uh, had very clear name containment. So this is my uh, my say for today. Okay, Rasa, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, and we're moving to another speaker immediately, Brian Whitemore non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Erosia Center and also also of the Power Vertical Block. So, Brian, please, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Andreas. And first of all, congratulations to Chatham House and to Kira on, an, on yet another uh, excellent report. You always you guys always seem to, to outdo yourself. Um, I wanted to start um, kind of riffing off of Kier's remark that Russia and the West speak two different languages of deterrence because I, I think this reflects a much broader reality that we, we find ourselves in, an almost paradoxical reality that is actually the subject of my own research at the moment. And I wanna kind of push the metaphor here that you use very aptly here. You said if a criminal family demands that all the other homes in a neighborhood remove their locks, alarms, and homeowner's insurance and, and make the neighborhood a no-go zone for the police, would we consider this an acceptable basis for negotiation? And I would even push that, that metaphor a little bit farther and say, well, imagine if that criminal family also has seats on the town council, you know, um, sh 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 shares in you know, local businesses and so on and so forth. And that criminal family is treated by, by the rest of the neighborhood and the police and, and, and the authorities in, in, in the town in question, like a respectable member of the community. Because um, that's, the, that's the reality we're living in. That's the baseline from which we are proceeding at the moment. Um, I often say we're in this Cold War style normative struggle in an interdependent and globalized world where we are actually all forced to live in the same neighborhood. In the Cold War, the big difference is we didn't live in the same, we live in the same neighborhood, but there's a big, big fence, you know, dividing the neighborhood. You had two hermetically sealed systems. Right now, we have this similar normative conflict going on between a Western system that's, that's, that's fundamentally based on the rule of law and institutions and accountability, transparency, and importantly in this sense, respect for the sovereignty of small states, a belief that the sovereignty of small states are, is, is, no, are, is no less sacrosanct than the sovereignty of, of, of great powers against a Russian system, of course, that's based on kleptocracy and autocracy and empire. Um, and everything proceeds from this baseline. Deterrence proceeds from this baseline, um, when this criminal family in this neighborhood makes a demand, we proceed from this baseline that they are a respectable member of the neighborhood. They have seats on the city council and they have shares in local businesses um, and, and, and therefore can, can affect this. The question I would like to ask is, should we change the baseline? Should we change the baseline from which this deterrence is proceeding? We up until now have allowed Russia to have it both ways. They're enjoying access to a globalized economy while actively undermining the rules of engagement 
that allow that global economy and that global system to function smoothly. Again, deterrence keeps proceeding from this baseline. And should we consider changing that? Um, Russia is behave, not behaving like a status quo power, yet it continues to have access to Western technology and Western financial markets. Our far, force posture in Europe reflects the, the, the belief, I believe misguided belief, that, that Russia does not pose a kinetic threat to Europe. And, I, and should we consider cha changing that force posture? Should we consider changing the macroeconomic arrangements? Um, now, if changing the baseline in the economic sense, you know, like it, it involves a lot of things that we've been talking about for years. Um, things like banning Russia from the SWIFT system, international payment system, um, like things like sanctioning Russian sovereign debt on the not just primary markets, but the more important secondary markets. Um, it could consider extreme measures like COCOM style Cold War era export restrictions. And if we were proceeding, and I'm asking this as a question as much as an assertion right now, because um, I'm thinking these things through myself, but would deterrence be more effective if we were proceeding from a more assertive baseline from, the, from Western posture? in every sense, not just the military sense, but also in the economic sense, with the understanding that these things would have costs. A swift ban on Russia would have much more serious costs. It's easy for me to say in Washington because it would have less effects on us here in the US than it would on Europe, given the level of trade with Russia. Would sanctioning Russian sovereign debt, what costs would that incur? What kind of costs would export restrictions incur? Um, Silicon Valley would probably scream bloody murder if we impose COCOM style export restrictions because they want to sell their smartphones in the big Russian market. Um, and we have to start asking ourselves some serious questions about what kind of costs are we willing to, 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 to incur right now um, in order to change this baseline? And would changing that baseline, in fact, make deterrence more effective? Because the or else that Putin would be facing in the event of a change baseline would not be, you know, a swift ban, a sanctioning of sovereign debt, and so on. It would it would be more severe than that, and that could possibly change Moscow's calculations. The question is how. Um, I, I I don't pretend that I have you know the magic answers or the magic bullet here. Um, I I really am grateful to you, Kier, and to to Chatham House as always for for jogging my. You know, my, 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 my own brain to, to, to think about these things um, because they're becoming, you know, if, if they're, they're far from theoretical at the moment as we look at what's going on on the Ukrainian border. But this is what I would like to throw out for discussion. Should we change the baseline from which we are proceeding? Should this criminal family no longer be allowed to have seats on the city council while it is demanding that all of the neighbors change their locks and, um, and, and, and and get rid of their homeowner's insurance and that the police not be allowed to come into the neighborhood. Shouldn't we just invite the police into the neighborhood and reinforce the locks and homeowner's insurances of, of, all, the, of all, all the homes in the neighborhood? Thank you very much. And now, uh, now I am moving uh, to uh, Andrei Ponkovsky. Uh, you know, I don't know even how to introduce, you know, terrific, you know, political writer, analyst, uh, scientist, everything, you know, and, uh, and especially, you know, uh, recently I was very much impressed by recent articles, at least I read them in Echo Moskvi, about uh, Putin's, uh, you know, wish to have uh, summits with, with uh, Biden. And uh, I was impressed by that analysis, uh, how Putin is feeling himself not so strong and for what reason he needs those summits. So I will not tell anything more, but Andre, really, it's it's pleasure to see you. Pleasure to have you here on, on, on our panel. And please, Andrei Pankovsky. You should unmute yourself. I do not see. Yeah. Andre, unmute yourself.
still yeah on you should press on the screen no we still do not hear you you are muted so got you on or not? I think okay, now we, uh, oh, yeah, perfect. Uh, you hear me, you hear me. Yes. Sorry for this um, inconvenience. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Andres, for your general introduction, generous introduction. Thank you, Chatham House, for inviting me in such uh, such significant moment in, in modern history. Uh, I, I suppose that when Chatham House uh, planned this event on December, uh, 20th, they could not imagine that this was the day when all the world is waiting a response from White House, a response uh, on which uh, the fate of deterrence of Russia depends completely. I talking with you from, from Washington and I have two, two news, uh, one good and one bad from, from from Washington, I I have a, I suspect that uh, this uh, advanced copy of this brilliant uh, care report was uh, provided to send to Washington to President uh, to President Biden, and he used this opportunity to commit all mistake one by one, all mistakes uh, in which were analyzed in this. Uh, brilliant report. Each mistake committed by Biden during the uh, latest six months emboldened uh, Putin more and more. And uh, I, I, in my recent article, I named this uh, uh, latest uh, ult Russian ultimatum, the pact, uh, uh, the pact uh, of, uh, what is the name of this, uh, Ryabkov. New, new Russian uh, foreign minister star, uh, Pact of Rebkov and Sullivan, because uh, Sullivan uh, was providing uh, all uh, this uh, uh, President Biden communication with Putin and making one concession uh, after all. But the good news from Washington is that this uh, appeasement policy provoke rejection in United States and inside, inside Biden administration. Biden administration is uh, divided now and uh, such key figures as uh, State Secretary um, Blinken and Defense Secretary Austin, they opposed in to Sullivan line. And if uh, this group uh, of uh, uh, is comparable inside administration. Another good news that uh, uh, American political, American establishment, American media, American Congress is overwhelmingly on the side of Ukraine, on the side of uh, uh, resisting uh, uh, Russian uh, demands and Russian blackmail. I disagree with one one your comment, Karen, in your in your remarks. You said that you want us that uh, if Putin, uh, if we fail with deterrence uh, of Putin in Ukraine, he will come uh, after other country. He have already come after many other country. Uh, there is maybe most. Uh, most outrageous element in his uh, new two documents is demand for nature, NATO infrastructure to remove to its its geographical geographical limits of 1997. This is practice. This practice means demand of removal of NATO infrastructure from Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Poland, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia. Uh, Romania, Bulgaria, he oft already come after many countries. And uh, 
It seems to me that I know why Putin Kremlin is so bold, so insolent, so assertive now with its ultimatum. They do, and I agree with you, Kara, in your uh, in your remarks that they do believe that their uh, their uh, aim uh, subjugate well, winning coordinator is achievable. And uh, I would add to you to your brilliant report one additional one additional very important chapter how to deter Russian so-called desescalation through nuclear escalation strategy. Believe me, is the central is the central element of their uh, plans of war in Europe. They do believe that they can can win uh, war in Europe. They realize that uh, on conventional level, uh, after mobilizing, mobilizing all forces, NATO is much stronger uh, than Russia. But their strategy is that uh, at particular moment where they become to lose this war, they raise stake, they stakes to nuclear level. They either threaten with limited nuclear strike or deliver limited nuclear strikes. Putin has enormous knows that he enormous he is inferior to NATO in everything, but he has an, one very important and key advantage. He is complete disregard for lives of millions of people, Russian and uh, uh, foreigners, and he is, uh, he is ready to raise stakes and uh, he convinced that West will blink at decisive moment and he will uh, uh, achieve, achieve his uh, political and military aims. This is, is the center uh, of his strategy. And the final remark, which I want to make, it's about wholeness of deterrence. Deterrence of Russia now is very strongly interconnected. Deterrence of Ukraine from Russian aggression is very strongly interconnected with task of deterrence of Taiwan from Chinese aggression. Especially now, after uh, after reputation after Western reputational catastrophe in Kabul, dictators uh, of world and first of all China and Russia are emboldened, they are emboldened by by this picture, and they are seeing that now they can achieve this. Uh, uh, aim of centuries of destroying destroying west russian empire and chinese empire uh, always pursued such ambitious ambitious aims and for destroying west completely it's necessary in their perception to to make two simple step to destroy ukrainian state and to destroy it, Taiwan state, and they coordinate their action. And that these two uh, states are entangled. Like, you know, in quantum mechanics, there are such phenomena as uh, quantum entanglement, when two particles, which were millions of light years apart, they are very strongly connected in change of what particle immediately immediately change the situation uh, in other. By the way, the main argument of Sullivan School in Washington is the following. The main task of United States is uh, confrontation with China and to, uh, to concentrate on this uh, task, uh, we should uh, uh, have a good relations with Russia to accommodate with Russia uh, maybe even to try to take over Russia on our side. It's, uh, I, it's Lenin would describe these people as very useful bourgeois idiots because uh, no, uh, 
because uh, when f if deterrence uh, fail in Ukraine, it, Im it, it will immediately fail uh, in Taiwan. And billions of people in Pacific region, which uh, are very much concerned with Chinese ambitious plan, and in principle are ready uh, to have alliance with, with the United States, uh, deterring China, I mean such uh, states as India, and Japan, Australia, and others, they are watching events very closely in, in Ukraine, judging the determination of uh, United States and their, uh, their readiness to exercise, exercise uh, deterrence. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Andrei. Thanks a lot, really, for your remarks, as always, very precise. And now uh, I will turn to uh, Mr. Olivier Vedrin, French political scientist and journalist, member of steering committee of the Jean Monnet Association. And Olivier, as we understand, you are still from Kiev. Or, yes. Know. Yeah. Yes. Good. So. Bonjour. Bonjour. Bonjour from Kiev, a Frenchman in Kiev. <laughs> uh, then uh, thank you for uh, for inviting me, um, and uh, I have some remarks um, about what the previous uh, speakers uh, said. First of first of all, I want to underline uh, that uh, with uh, my friend uh, Andrei Piankovsky, we were in Lviv a few years ago in for a conference in the Catholic University, and for me it's obvious that uh, we lost a lot of time to react. And uh, when we were together in this conference, that was almost the same subject. What we have to do to stop Putin? That was seven years ago. And what is the result now is that we are in the corner. Then Putin is playing, is weak, but is playing with our mistake. He's playing with our weakness, but we are more strong than him is a perfect KGB agent. He wants us to believe that is the strongest. And this is, this is our mistake. I think the fear must change and be on his side. Because if we don't stop him now, he will continue for sure. And I'm, I agree with Andre. When Andre say that he's already in other state member of the European Union. For example, his influence in a lot of state member of the EU is very efficient. In France, a lot of candidates for the presidential election want to speak with Putin and to make alliance, can I say, alliance with, with, with Putin, with Russia, but Russian Putin. And because of what? Because of Russia today. Why we didn't close Russia today? then we were very weak and this is, we cannot understand logically if we see this situation, how this country with the same GDP than Italy with 10% with of the military budget of US can, can disturb all the democrat, democratic family, why? We are in the same, uh, can say, the same uh, period than in, in the college, in the school, when, when some bad boy uh, uh, is playing and all the good, good, good uh, students are afraid. Why all those good students are afraid? Because they are not united. Then since 2008, and I was in Baku in 2008, since 2008, since the war in Georgia, we try to discuss with Putin. And since 2008, what he did, he improved his military equipment. He put a lot of money in all this military program. We are strong, but, and for me, what we are, looking now is, and I, I, I really like Brzezinski for that, 
is for me the beginning of the end of this Putin period. This absolutely ridiculous, 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 ridiculous uh, proposal of of Russia uh, for NATO to to uh, is really for me not logical, but this is the symptom of sickness and of the end of this period. The problem is we are assisting at the end of this Putin period. The problem is how this period will end with a war. Then another aspect is that we have, we must, and we lost time. We must speak more and more and push the Russian opposition. We didn't do enough for that. We have also to split between Putin and the people, the Russian people. Because if you see some polls, if you see some newspaper, Russian newspaper, the Russian people, they don't want to go to war. Yes, the propaganda is heavy, but as a leading strategy, we have to cut the policy of Russia in several pieces the state, the government, the Russian opposition. We have to do the same strategy than Putin. He's cutting the European Union. He's cutting uh, the United States. We have to do the same. And what I don't understand, and thank you for, for Andrei Piankowski, we are assisting now with this Putin strategy, like I say, if you read the book of Lenin strategy and Soviet strategies, it's all, almost the same. And I don't understand why nobody in our rulers and president is obvious that we have, we have, to, we have to fight against a man who think like Lenin. What, what Lenin said, he said that we have, to, we have to test the West, we have to continue to push them, and we have to stop when it will, it will stop us and this is this is the same putin will be afraid only if he if we are united and if we push him then for me i, I also want to react on this uh, idea of uh, andrei piankovsky about china and russia yes of course china in russia in this is a global strategy if tomorrow Russia will do something and attack Ukraine, at the same time, of course, uh, Taiwan will be invited. And, uh, and for, for Europe and for US, this is the biggest problem. Because they see that they have some partnership between Russia and, and China against the Western democracy. And to, to hand, I want to say that, um, you know, for me, uh, this is the Russian Federation is a mafia empire, and this is exactly uh, the way of thinking of a Gopnik politician. They are using always uh, force, weapon, intimidation, uh, and you cannot, as you said, give the key uh, to the to the bandit then we, we must reinforce our police. We must reinforce uh, our uh, law sanctions, not sanctions against the people, sanctions against some member of the government. You know, I am a member of the board of Jean Monnet Association. Jean Monnet always do a difference between the people and the state and the government. We have to unite people and we have to unite People, that means we have to do a difference and to split between this Russian government and the Russian people and help the Russian people to be a democracy and help the Russian opposition. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Olivier. It sounded exactly what we put into our report on EU policy towards Russia, that uh, first of all, we need to make a difference in between of uh, Kremlin and Russian people. Good. And now the last uh, speaker, Mr. Andrei Zakhorodnyuk, Chairman of Center for Defense Strategies and former Defense Minister of Ukraine. 
Andre, please, floor is yours. Andres, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, nice to hear that uh, uh, Olivia was in uh, Ukrainian Catholic University. That's where I am right now, reading lecture in half an hour from now, or an hour. Um, and uh, uh, it's, uh, yes, and I will be definitely quoting that report uh, from Kier. And uh, thank you very much for the report. It's very good. What many times I already sent it to friends and colleagues, quoted it and so on, because we, we do agree. And uh, we do agree with uh, practically all of the, all, all of its provisions. Uh, but let let me get to some of the basics. So Putin is a gross violator of international law, uh, and many many cases uh, he's caused like lots of deaths, lots of uh, civilians, uh, lots of internally displaced people, huge uh, losses in properties, values, and so on. So unexplainable um, and still not calculated. Uh, the problem is that international law is as good as the extent to which you can enforce it. And uh, he is testing the limits of the enforceability of the law uh, till the very end. So uh, lots of things he passed with the political sanctions, which were very uh, light for, for them, for their economy, or something which they could swallow and move ahead. Uh, so they could uh, they could afford to uh, capture um, 100,000 kilometers, uh, 100,000 square kilometers of Black Sea region which nobody even, talk, many people don't even talk about right now, Crimea, you know, Sea of Azov, which currently is practically closed for navigation and so on and so on. So there's lots of, uh, there's lots of things which they did without many consequences, uh, which reinforced uh, his uh, behavior and said, okay, now you can move on. Uh, and now he's threatening with the, uh, with the, with the invasion, with the full-scale invasion to, to Ukraine. And what do we see? We see lots of, um, uh, lots of uh, uh, various messages from everybody. Uh, and uh, now the question is, the big question is, how real are his threats? And really, if he can afford a full-scale war? Because one thing is if it's, they're real, and the other one is if he's practically coming and expecting the world to be scared and uh, uh, negotiate without a need to show that whether he's, he's ready or not, and whether he has uh, uh, the actual... Uh, whether he dares actually to cross the border uh, of Ukraine. Uh, we did some analysis on this, and we do believe that uh, it will be extremely dangerous for Russia to start that uh, operation. And I'm not talking about hybrid, I'm not talking about further intimidations or information operations, cyber, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's many things he can do without actually crossing the border. But the biggest fear of, uh, let's say, American politicians and some European politicians is actually, actually he's going to to cross the border with a full-scale invasion uh, to Ukraine. And uh, there's many experts, especially in Washington, D.C., who are saying that he's ready to take the whole Ukraine or half of Ukraine, and so on and so on. Uh, according to our estimations, and when I'm saying ours, I don't mean Ukraine, I mean our center, which in, includes lots of uh, former military from Ukraine and abroad, from NATO countries. We don't think it's realistic. We don't think it's, uh, we think it's, uh, it will be the biggest uh, mistake he can do, historical mistake, and he will end up with the potentially fail of his regime. And I think they know that because we've seen lots of messages and some of the um, uh, data from Russia, actually, where the people realize that uh, actually the big serious invasion is not going to, it's, it's, he can easily start that project. He can actually commence it. He can actually move quite along, but uh, uh, there is very little chance for him to su finish it successfully and actually hold that territory and turn it into the colony, which you know doesn't bankrupt the country or doesn't turn it in, 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 into a huge problem, which, which he won't be able to, to, uh, to digest. So in this case, what he's doing is more look like if we quote if we look at the game theory it looks like the game when there are two cars uh, approaching one another uh, where each driver hopes that the other one will turn and avoid collision which is uh, very often used in business and politics and so on and uh, in uh, such case we uh, we believe that with all his boldness and his um, his assertion and, and so on. He, he's expecting the world to actually uh, do not expect him to start the in, uh, invasion and actually uh, start negotiating. Um, sadly, we're hearing from the United States very often messages which are exactly fitting into this, pro in, into this pattern. So, for example, we often hear from U.S. politicians and U.S. Uh, state um, 
uh, government uh, uh, officials and so on that uh, their main priority is to avoid the conflict, uh, so to avoid the full scale war. And then we can quote Kiev's report where uh, that is quoted as a direct mistake because it does reinforce, it does show that you are ready to, to kind of uh, start to turn from, uh, from, from sort of that game. Now, the question how US could be dragged into that game, if our hypothesis is correct, how that could be dragged into this game by allowing Putin to uh, do certain things and, uh, uh, and actually set the rules. So for instance, when he had a previous buildup in April, uh, how it ended up? It ended up with the massive, big, highly publicized meeting in Geneva where he almost treated Putin as equal. And uh, Putin received such a big attention like no other leader uh, received from, from, from the president of the United States. So his ego was obviously blown till, I don't know, till, 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 till maximum with all this press atten attention, with the public attention and so on and so on. Uh, and realistically, what, what happened? They, they didn't agree about anything. So it's, uh, it was pretty purely the um, a win uh, from that perspective. So, uh, so through that, he actually started to dictate uh, to actually um, with the methods of reflexive control, which are very, very popular in Russian politics, he started to kind of shape the uh, next move. Um, and what do we see right now? We, we see right now uh, politicians are saying that we need to ensure that there is no invasion. We need to ensure that there is no, um, there is no massive conflict in Europe and so on and so on. And essentially, uh, essentially sending signals that they are in a way they're ready for the negotiations. Uh, so as uh, one of the think tanks called Institute of Studies of War written recently in a recent report that uh, if Putin never planned in a full-scale invasion, then in return, he will receive uh, some concessions and he will give back the agreement not to invade Ukraine, which he might have not planned in, in the first place. And that looks very much like Russian uh, approach, rather, more than actually planning a real invasion. So to, to, to sit on the table and give up pretty much nothing but receive, the, uh, receive some concessions in return, whatever they are. Question is, why did they publish a, such a bold uh, requirement like for, the, for NATO not to extend anywhere and so on and so on? And many people were wondering like why they're so, um, why they're so aggressive, why they started with a, such an unachievable, unachievable goal. Well, to set the negotiation uh, starting position, obviously, because then whatever they're going to go down from, that will be already uh, uh, produced as a, some sort of uh, uh, concessions from their side. And they will still be unhappy, as very often uh, Russian government is after any negotiation. They're still unhappy and they're still saying that, yeah, well, okay, that's a, some, some sort of a um, uh, possibility for them, but they, they still reserve the, move, the, 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 the right for the next move and so on and so on. So the, uh, yes, I fully agree that negotiation at the gain point, it's not a negotiation, uh, it's robbery. And uh, it's actually reacting to the robbery. It's like if somebody asks you to, to give a donation to charity at the gun point, that's not donation. Um, and so, um, so the, biggest, the biggest mistake, I believe, and uh, uh, again, this is a very subjective opinion, but the biggest mistake is to still play that game and not get out of the game, not get out of that frame and say, we're not going to negotiate at the gun point. Uh, any discussions can only start when the, we clearly see that there is, uh, there is no threat because, because that devalues the whole point of, uh, of, of, of a fair uh, discussions and negotiations. Thank you very much. Ah, thanks a lot. Uh, okay. Really, uh, all, all the presentations are now over. Thanks a lot, Andre, for the last one. And now we are moving into question and answer session. And I am a little bit, uh, uh, how to say, lost because uh, it looks like really that seminar is so, is so interesting to many, many, you know, big experts in the field that uh, I never saw so many questions. So I, I will ask, you know, uh, also speakers to look into into the chat, but I will I will read maybe some uh, some uh, questions which uh, which came, and then you know maybe uh, really 
Uh, first of all, of course, uh, the questions are uh, directed to Kier, uh, Giles, then maybe all others will, 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 will also join. First of all, and of course, privilege is given to those whom we know, you know from our uh, seminars, like active participants, and of course, they are very well-known experts. And I will start from uh, our long-standing uh, uh, friend and 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 uh, you know and and uh, colleague uh, Roland Frangenstein, now from uh, Globsec. And his uh, first question sounds like that. First of all, thanks for a brilliant text, one of the most important ones in the Russia debate since 2014. So that's directly to Kerr. Uh, and uh, here is my question. If we agree that Russia must become a normal country, that's not non-empire, non in order to become a partner we can live with, shouldn't we assume that this is only possible in a future Russian democracy? Is it helpful to exclude such a democracy a priori? Because as Bignev Zhezhinsky would say, Russia is either an empire or a democracy. So this is the first question of, of, uh, of Roland. And the second question, uh, did deterrence work in, uh, worked in April when nuclear capable fighter bombers were redeployed by the US to Poland? And some days later, the Russian troop build up at the Ukrainian border was reversed into withdrawal. Or was it uh, Geneva summit, perhaps Geneva, Ron writes about Vienna, Geneva perhaps summit, Biden-Putin had, that incentivized Putin to draw down his forces, or maybe both parties. And then I would like to read also under Saslan question, uh, which are the best actions in the Biden administration, uh, the Biden administration can do today for deterrence? Zach Sullivan, refute uh, Putin's all demands and raise as a demands of a more military supplies, clarify that uh, Nord Stream 2 and SWIFT will be sanctioned, become more unclear about NATO military role, prepare map for Ukraine, demand that all talks take place within the OSCE and that Russia honors the Helsinki Final Act and later OCT agreements or what? So those are uh, very, very clear questions. And I maybe stop here, then we shall move maybe to uh, other questions. But now I will ask really uh, Kerr Jels to start uh, his 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 uh, you know, discussion, his uh, his answers to the questions. Thank you, Andres. Yes, I'm going to be super brief because there are, as you say, a lot of really good questions from uh, from the right people in the chat, and would be nice to actually get through all of them if we possibly can. Um, but in answer to those three questions, each of which we could talk about for hours, uh, the first one, um, does, do we need Russia to become a democracy in order that it can interact with other countries around it in, in a normal fashion that we think is, is not, um, not coming from a previous century? I don't really understand why we do. I don't really understand why we need to have a political system which is so completely alien to what Russia is in order for it to coexist with, with other political systems. I think there are plenty of examples where you have states which we would consider by modern standards authoritarian, which are not inclined always to invade their neighbors and don't have pretensions to an empire. Now, yes, that would be completely unrecognizable from the Russia we know and have known for centuries. But let's not forget that this process that we're talking about of Russia becoming normal is not something that's going to happen overnight. This is the extremely long-term aspiration. After all, to consider how many, um, how many previous empires we have seen that went through much more traumatic uh, processes of defeat in losing their empire than Russia did. Uh, and in terms of not the initial collapse, but the the painful withdrawal and the fights and the defeats that uh, that Russia has not yet had, and still it took time to adjust that mindset. It will be correspondingly that much longer for Russia. I don't think democracy, as we understand it, necessarily has to be a, a part of that process. Of course, we would all like that to happen, and we would like to happen for Russians themselves. Uh, but uh, in terms of the aspirations that we should have for Russia being a manageable country with which we can deal, I think um, there might be some, uh, some less ambitious objectives that we could look for first. 
And the second part of that question, or the, or the second question from Ron was about the, the success of Russia's deployment in April and what it was exactly that caused that to be suspended and partially withdrawn, let's not forget, leaving a large amount of equipment prepositioned. I do not see any steps that were taken by Western powers, including the United States, as influencing the course of that deployment. Instead, as we heard already from Andriy Zarodnyuk, it was the recognition. It was the, uh, the summit, it was the treating Russia as again the counterpart of the United States for settling these big issues, which, def which diffused the immediate crisis, but also for Russia validated the concept. Yes, once again, Russia can press the same old buttons for the US and get the same very gratifying responses. So Russia can be more confident when it comes to November that going through precisely the same process is actually going to get the results that they want in terms of getting attention and getting their demands listened to. Anders came back with uh, a, a list of things that we might be able to do. We, the United States mostly, might be able to do in terms of policy responses. I would agree with all of them, except potentially the, the first one, Sacking Sullivan. Why would, the, why would any of these not be valid choices on the table? And in particular, um, what Anders was saying about the response to the demands that have been made by Russia. Again, uh, let me echo Andri's uh, point about uh, this being um, a maximalist approach which makes it feel like a success to conflict-averse European politicians if not all of those demands are actually achieved, if some of them are rejected. But again, it is Russia demanding concessions for no counterpart. And if we're in the, the section of the, the deterrence paper that discussed precisely this approach and laid out how it works, we refer to this as Russia consistently winning by demanding the whole of somebody else's cake and then ingraciously settling for only half, but people that have been frightened into terminal jitters by the prospect of Russia's military might thinks that only giving the half the cake away is actually a success. And yes, there should be counter proposals. And I would point people to the, the initial list that has been put together by former ambassador to Moscow, Mike McFall, in terms of the things that Russia ought to be doing if it actually wants to have a serious conversation about reorganizing the security structure in Eastern Europe. And many of them include not attacking or occupying its neighbors. That should be a starting point for where exactly we have this conversation about behavior of states in 21st century Europe. But I will stop there and greatly looking forward to seeing how many more of the, the great questions we can tackle. Okay, okay. So uh, thanks a lot. I am moving to, uh, you know, next questions maybe. I don't know who will take. Uh, the first one is from Dimitros Kurko. Maybe Rasa can take. Uh, he's from National News Agency of Ukraine. It's, of course, a question is to all participants. Do Europe understand counting the price for Russian aggression that the main cost Russia would pay not because of sanctions, but because Ukrainians they have no other choice but uh, uh, fight to the end. Maybe such an understanding could make it easier for Europe to stand straight under Russian blackmail. And next question from uh, uh, Brian Cartledge. Uh, I don't know who will take, but uh, yeah, I'm just reading, you know, uh, to announce it. It is certainly possible, as uh, Kair argues, that Putin has made his latest demand in the belief, fortified by recent Western behavior, that they might actually be accepted. Might an alternative possible explanation be that the demands have been made in the belief that they will be rejected, thus providing the pretext for aggressive action. Uh, next one mm, uh, is, uh, is from uh, 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 Maria Avdeva. Uh, thank you for the brilliant discussion. My question is, if the West uh, is not able to develop joint position to deter Russia, should Ukraine rely on regional formats of cooperation like Lublin Triangle, for example, and bilateral relations? Maybe uh, that is a question to Andre. And, uh, uh, and then, yeah, again, uh, uh, questions perhaps to Kerr. Alex Folks, uh, Kerr says that the West uh, fails to understand the mindset of Russia and is not telling Putin that the age of empires is over. But is that not also failing to understand that Russia views NATO and to a lesser extent the EU as empires? And uh, yeah, and those are the questions. 
which for time being I have uh, at least the questions, not comments. So I will switch immediately to to ask uh, our participants, maybe you know, starting from the last ones, uh, to try to answer and to react to in general to the debate. But in addition to that, I would like also to put one question, and it's about uh, you know I. Again, I am I am referring to Andre Konkovsky articles, you know, recent ones, and for me that is a question about diagnosis. I am wondering, you know, what really is behind this behavior of uh, Putin, which is, for me, it looks a little bit strange, and I see some kind of uh, you know desperation, and I'm wondering if. Is that you know behavior because Putin feels himself so strong that he can you know blackmail uh, West and so on and so on, or is that uh, because he is starting to feel that his geopolitical power is uh, weakening? You know both domestically where he got only thirty percent of you know United Russia got only thirty percent of votes. You know, externally, Belarusian democratization and things like that, that he is becoming really in some way desperate. And then all those, you know, uh, all those, uh, his actions is some kind of trolling, you know, uh, looking. So what, what will be the reaction of the West? And then he, you know, in such a way, like, you know, the guy from the street in Petersburg, you know, in, in in Leningrad, uh, he is really behaving like like simple hooligan, you know. So then, if we could have some kind of diagnosis, you know, so what's what's really behind? Is that out from strength of his, you know, feeling how powerful is he, or is that from the weakness? Maybe then we could have better understanding what kind of deterrence really is uh, is you know available, and 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 what kind of deterrence we need to implement. So those are my 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 uh, my simple thoughts. But now I will start from, uh, as I said, from from uh, those who, you know, ended our our panel discussion. Andre, please, and Andre Zakharnyuk, your comments, you know, uh, from what you, you know, what we discussed and from the questions which came. We do not hear. Yeah, unmute yourself. Is it? Yeah, please uh, unmute yourself. We do not hear you. Yeah, very sorry. Yeah, okay. No. Okay, so I'll start with the question from the um, from the uh, gentleman from uh, news agency uh, about the local uh, local resistance. So uh, there is a there is a, a substantial like sort of a position in of the many experts and particularly in the United States that uh, if Russia wants to start the campaign, Ukrainian army is not going to be a major obstacle. Uh, that is uh, based on the mathematical calculation of the capabilities, which are indeed very different. And uh, this is based on the fact that Ukraine has a, a number of capability gaps, particularly tactical aviation, uh, um, air defense and, uh, and, uh, and the Navy. The problem is that, uh, as our own experience in 2014 shows, the mathematical comparison of capabilities is a very big mistake, because uh, because there's a lot of other aspects which participate in the, in the decision whether to proceed or not to proceed, and uh, creating damage which is kind of a, a unbearable damage for the for the for the aggressor. Uh, we do not seriously think that 175,000, which are currently at the border, is uh, even close to uh, be able to 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 uh, to um, actually uh, occupy Ukraine. We think that this would be, number should grow uh, uh, in a region of 400,000, which is pretty much all battlefield ready units of, of, of Russia, among of which there's lots of conscripts which do not have any experience and often don't have even sufficient training. So it will not be a quick victorious war. And, um, and what is also important is that Ukraine has a shortage of the uh, very serious platforms like weapon platforms, but, uh, but, uh, but a large amount of people who are happy to defend and the statistics which are currently done almost every week about like readiness of the population to defend are uh, quite impressive uh, saying that uh, like a vast majority is happy to um, to uh, to defend the country even if it's like a territorial defense or uh, resistance and insurgency and so on where 
in which cases those capability advantages become useless. Well, in large to, to, to a great extent. So, uh, so yes, one of the key things which Russia has to take into account, and I'm sure that they, their analysts know about that, is the um, massive, massive capability of Ukraine for, to resist the aggression and actually make that uh, aggression a very, very painful experience. Um, so the next question was about the um, uh, was about what Ukraine should do in the case if West is not coming with a joint position. Uh, we got we used to that. Uh, we used to have a West uh, don't have a, a joint position pretty much on any of the questions, uh, almost. And uh, yes, we we are dealing with countries directly, so we have discussions with uh, many countries, and particularly, for example, United Kingdom has a very decisive position and a very clear position on this. Uh, actually, European Parliament just voted about the SWIFT uh, SWIFT uh, uh, sanctions if in case of Russia aggression start and so on and so on. So, so there's like a lot of direct bilateral conversations happening as we speak, uh, on quite actively. And finally, um, Andres, to your question regarding Putin motives and uh, whether this is insecurity, whether this opportunity and so on. Again, this is very subjective, but our studies have shown that what Putin is doing is he has a so-called adaptive or emergent strategy approach. In a business, it's very well known is when you have when you don't have a clear linear linear plan outlined and you moving according to this plan, but what you have, you have a very stable, very clear strategic goals. And then you're constantly changing ways how you reach them. And you try something, it doesn't work, you step back, then you try something else, it doesn't work, you step back until you find something which works. So uh, so that essentially for a long time, they were trying to different approaches for Ukraine, for the other countries, and so on and so on. And we believe that they have chosen that approach because they have a, a, a some sort of assurance that this approach may work. And it's based on previous smaller scale experiences such as reaction of uh, United States for the April crisis, Nord Stream 2 decision, which I think has a direct cause and effect uh, relationship between this, uh, this situation and Nord Stream 2 decision in summertime, and so on and so on. So, so they see the opportunity, they see the division in the, in the White House administration, and I think they, they're thinking who knows when this opportunity comes again, uh, things moving. They should they should jump on it and they should use it to uh, till the end and it's very very calculated decision we believe because they're very rational and I'm sure that it's not just Putin's ambitions or fears or anything this is a, a some sort of a collective mega mind been working on many different scenarios calculations and so on again this subjective opinion thank you okay thanks a lot Andre thanks a lot and now Olivia please. Yes, I, I agree with you, uh, Andre, about this. This is a calculation. This is a game theory, you know, uh, and they are using that very well, very well. Uh, you, I am, I am, I wrote a book about game theory in economy and political science. And uh, really, uh, the, this is obvious that we have to face uh, a very complicated, can say, strategy, but also very pragmatic strategy, as you said. And uh, I think we, we, we must use the same. And for me, uh, it's obvious that uh, we, are, uh, we are not playing at the same level. First of all, I agree with uh, Dimitri from this National Agency of, of Ukraine uh, that we, the West, must be united. And as Andrei say, the West is not united. Ukraine is always speaking with with one member, uh, with one member state of the European Union, or with UK, or with US. And I, I don't see a strong unity of Western democracy. This is a challenge for Western democracy. Ukraine is a battlefield. And I think we, we now, we are on the crossroad. We must think like Western democracy and not like uh, only member state of the, of, of the European Union or, 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 or member or state of, of the Western world. Then, but I am, I am very happy that Andre, Andre on the line that this is uh, the game theory, Nash theory, and they are using that very well. And, and also with manipulation, this system is very efficient. Thank you. 
Thanks a lot. And now I am turning to Andrei Pankowski. Yeah, please, Andrei. Still, we do not hear. I think that this latest uh, Putin demarche is a combination of his understanding of failure in Ukraine. Uh, he realized that uh, uh, military intervention inside Ukraine will uh, be very uh, costly for his regime, first of all, in terms of uh, military losses of Russia. Even Russian society with all its uh, uh, more or less uh, uh, loyal, loyalty to regime uh, will not tolerate uh, human losses. And uh, note that he concentrated all his efforts, including international efforts, on his interpretation of Minsk agreement, of using the instrument of so-called ordo, what he demands from Ukraine, to legalize in Ukrainian political uh, space this uh, Russian military uh, terrorist uh, arm. You know, it's, uh, it's old Stalin uh, school, by the way, uh, in 1952, Stalin makes a suggestion to Chancellor Adenauer, let's uh, satisfy desires of German people and let's unite. Stalin has his own order. It was named GDI. Let's unite my GDI with Federal Republic of Germany. And Adenauer answered him, thank you, uh, Marshal Stalin, but I would prefer to be chancellor in one half of Germany and not political prisoner in the United Germany. This is the same, same trick which uh, uh, Putin uh, tries to play with Ukraine. And the note with what obsession he tries to involve Westerners in his game. Well, Merkel and Macron participated uh, to much extent in this pressure on, on, on uh, Ukraine. He was triumphant in Geneva because he extracted, extracted from uh, Biden support, the simple phrase that Minsk agreement is the best way of solving the Congress. He again extract, extracted the same mem from him during video conference because it's uh, uh, an, an interesting how uh, this, the Biden presents this case to American society. He said, well, uh, we discuss of uh, Putin wants to give, I quote exactly his formal, to give uh, some degree of autonomy to some uh, uh, Ukraine region. You know, for ordinary Americans, does it, uh, uh, whether Americans are ready to fight, to face a prospect of nuclear war and by, for the sake of degree of autonomy of uh, uh, some of, it's not a uh, issue of degree of autonomy, it's issue of destroying uh, uh, America, uh, Ukrainian state. And Putin now concentrate on internalization on his this instrumentation, his case, his case was first of all into the agreement to push Ukraine uh, to legalizing uh, Ordor, but uh, it's uh, uh, no he will get no results because uh, uh, Ukraine rejected. Uh, this way very firmly and they answered Putin in the same form as uh, 50 years ago Adenauer answered to Stalin. Yeah, thanks a lot, Andre. Now I turn to Brian Whitemore. Please, Brian. What was the question? In general, your you know <laughs> remarks uh, before we are quitting our seminar. Oh no, I mean I, I I would refer back to this remark about about democracy that Roland brought up, and I I, I would not I would not create, present it in that way. I would frame it in a little bit of a different way. As long as Russia remains 
a kleptocratic autocracy that aspires to empire, then it should be isolated and we should move this baseline from which we are proceeding. Um, I don't think the question is an all or nothing one about, uh, about democracy, but Russia in its current form, to go back to the neighborhood metaphor, should be pushed out of the neighborhood. This criminal family should be pushed out of the neighborhood and steps should be taken to do that. I think the baseline from which we are operating right now puts us at a, uh, at, 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 at a position of weakness. So I think that would be the, um, the, the the main thing. And I'd also like to respond to a question that was in the in the chat about Belarus, because it has not come up at all in this entire discussion. And I think that the what is going on in the Ukrainian border and the threat of a, a full scale Russian invasion of Ukraine is intimately related to what is going on in Belarus. Um, over the past year, Russia has effectively solidified its control over Belarus. Um, it's expanded steadily its military, economic, and political footprints in Belarus. Um, and now Belarus is a platform from which to attack Ukraine. So Putin has achieved one of his key goals right now. Ukraine and Belarus are the two most important countries for Russia in terms of its perceived need for strategic depth and its perceived uh, need for to, to restore the empire. Um, it has achieved largely through what I consider almost a soft annexation of Belarus over the last year. But in that same time period, Ukraine has moved farther and farther, taken steps to move as far out of the Russian orbit as possible. Um, the shutting down of the pro-Kremlin TV channels, the arrest of Medvedchuk, uh, President Zelensky successfully resisting the Russian interpretation of Minsk. And so while Russia has been gaining something in Belarus, it is feeling it is losing something in Ukraine. It is attempting to reverse that and to leverage Belarus. Um, and again, I would argue and this, this, does, this does not look good from the perspective of the West right now. We need to change the baseline um, from which we are operating. So that would be my going back to my original comments. That's what I think we need to do um, in the short run. Uh, thank you. OK, thanks a lot. I see. Well, the seminar is so interesting that I was not watching, you know, uh, uh, my my watch, and I see that somebody is, uh, needs to leave. So Olivia is, is uh, quitting, you know, quite soon. But most important that Kair, you know, is also uh, needs to leave. So Rasa, uh, if I can switch a little bit, you know, now to Kair, you will be then. Rasa will be the last one to speak. Kair, your 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 last comment then. Thank you very much, Andreas. There's an awful lot that we could pull out there, and there are a lot of clever things that have already been said that nobody needs to hear me repeat, but also so many more questions. It's a shame we didn't get to in the chat. Uh, the one thing that uh, that I would leave everybody with, because I think it's something that has not been discussed uh, enough, the, co the question has been raised, but we've never really pulled at it, is the incentives that um, that Russia would have for actually mounting a land assault on Ukraine, which is the assumption that has been driving so many of the responses to the apparent threat from Russia. And uh, Andrei has already explained some of the reasons why um, this would not actually be a realistic course of, uh, course of action if Russia is looking for substantial territorial gains, but also Let's also consider what would be the purpose of the limited land grab that's being put forward as an alternative solution. Yes, certainly it would be um, <clears throat> it would be highly expensive for Putin, but what would be the return on that investment? What would Russia gain from having another slice of Ukrainian territory that it does not already have through uh, the control of Donetsk and Lugansk? Not a lot, I would say, because it already has that control on Ukrainian political processes and means of escalating the war. I think we should be focusing far more on what can be done, as Andrei put it, from across the border. And we should look more at what Russia has been talking about in terms of means of deterrence, intimidation, compellence, bending other countries to your will that do not involve actually rolling tanks across the frontier. Yes, cyber. Yes, economic means, yes, energy, yes, missile strikes to target critical infrastructure punctuated by a re-emphasis of the demands. So in my view, the land invasion that has everybody so concerned is one of the least likely scenarios for what Russia might actually do with its forces. And let's not forget that uh, where uh, those forces are is equally well suited to arriving at a permanent presence in Belarus after the end of the winter, which can be presented if Putin needs to present some kind of win from the current situation as both 
pushing back Western influence and extending Russia's own control in a way which poses a direct threat not only to Ukraine's northern front, but also to those NATO members that are alongside Belarus. So all that to say, there are a lot more options here for how Russia could develop this situation further that do not in fact involve a land invasion. However, let's park that for the moment and consider instead the broader topic, because instead of being mesmerized by the threat that is posed by the gun to the head of Ukraine and the demands that come with it, we do need to step back and see precisely what the longer term course of those relations would be and where exactly it is possible for Russia to end up in that longer term and for Europe to be a safer place as a result. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been a, an absolutely delightful and fascinating seminar, but I'm afraid at this point I have to leave you. Thank you and goodbye. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, really, thanks a lot for your for your both paper and your and your uh, presentation here. Good luck. We we wait for next. You know your your papers and now Rasa Rasa uh, You know the last speaker in our on our panel. Please your concluding remarks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. And of course, uh, a lot uh, was already said, and I don't want to repeat, but. My feeling is that um, maybe in answer is <laughs> to the many questions and to the topic as such. Um, uh, Kremlin wants us to stay a little bit lost. Uh, we are discussing in different formats, uh, highest level politicians, experts, uh, people everywhere are discussing and uh, and, uh, and uh, of course um, Putin uh, maybe um, as always, he is testing and provoking the West. Um, Putin believes, I, I, I think so, Putin believes that the West is weak. Uh, I remember the situation when uh, uh, Putin started his uh, mil uh, Kremlin's military built up next to um, Baltic States and Poland in 2009 just after the um, attacks against Georgia. And at that time, it was some kind of, uh, uh, you know, situation when everybody, all main countries were collaborating with the new Russia, a lot of expectations, business, and nobody, nobody in NATO at that time, I was uh, attending those gatherings, Nobody was speaking about uh, Russian, Russian military builds ups. You would be like, I don't know who uh, accepted like crazy person if you would start to speak about that in official uh, NATO, NATO um, gatherings. It was, it was uh, even about uh, exercises based on Article 5 were not possible to speak. So today's situation, of course, is a little bit better, but still uh, Putin believes that he is able to provoke and to test, uh, uh, to test NATO, to test uh, especially NATO. And at that time in 2012, I remember that we were talking among our uh, colleagues uh, in the United States and uh, elsewhere, why Putin is doing this, why he is spending so much money for these military built ups next to tiny uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. Uh, they are, at that time, we had no capabilities at all. Uh, military, any capabilities at all. Uh, so the answer was the only answer at that time was to test NATO, uh, to test the West. Uh, and uh, it was easy to do at that time. Of course, Ukraine changed in 2014, changed situation. And, uh, and we were uh, at that time, of course, we have to be thankful. Ukrainians uh, lost their lives, but we avoided uh, such kind of blitzkrieg maybe uh, against us. NATO was not tested at that time uh, as organization. So now, I don't know, maybe it's also time to test somehow NATO. There are uh, different, different maybe calculations. Mm, but uh, until now, Kremlin deliberately is acting below NATO Article 5. 
they are not going through that more than Article 5. All those hybrid attacks, attack against Ukraine, attack against some, somewhere, they are below Article 5. Uh, and um, uh, who knows what the tactics today, what is the main goal of today, of today's ultimatums? Maybe it's very simple. Maybe uh, just, uh, for example, Nord Stream 2. Uh, because if somebody say today that if you will attack again Ukraine, uh, we will not, the certification will not come for uh, Nord Stream 2, what does it mean? It means that if not, you will get Nord Stream 2, Nord Stream 2, but Nord Stream 2, we don't need Nord Stream 2 at all as uh, uh, European Union, as, as, as the West, not, not to be more dependent. Or, of course, uh, one is clear for me uh, that uh, uh, Putin, uh, this and Kremlin, they desperately needs Ukraine. It's, uh, it's very important for them because of the two reasons. One, it's already was uh, mentioned, no empire without uh, Ukraine, of course, Belarus uh, together, and because of the bad experience for Russians themselves. Uh, if Ukraine, uh, success of Ukraine will, 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 will happen. So, of course, uh, of course, um, uh, but, 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 but my conclusion is again the same. The same. Uh, most important is not to be afraid. Uh, despite that uh, Russia, of course, is um, uh, nuclear power, despite that, uh, of course, tensions are, 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 are on the table, but uh, uh, Kremlin is using these attacks, as I said below Article 5, to create all the time these so-called low, low tension wars against democracies, because democracies, uh, for them, it's, uh, uh, it's very dangerous to live in these tensions, and they understand every five, four year election, every five, four year new presidents or new parliaments, people are exhausted, people are afraid. So for them, uh, for, 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 for Putin is clear that attacks and attacks and to, to live in such a uh, situation as we live now, it's uh, for them maybe it's useful because uh, he is, they are organizing their own people, but for democracies, is, is dangerous. So that's why they are trying to, to, to put us into the situation when we always are discussing and discussing, are afraid and afraid. And he is getting something and that uh, prolongs his uh, kleptocratic regime, uh, which is uh, most important, most important uh, uh, for them. He expects that some countries will be frightened. Some important countries maybe will be frightened, and 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 this is their their tactics. Don't believe, don't uh, feel guilty. We are not guilty. NATO is not uh, uh, offensive uh, structure. Uh, NATO is uh, what we can get the best, what we can get in 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 the Baltic states and other countries. So it's very good example uh, for other countries. Let's go forward. And uh, uh, on the other hand, my last point is, um, uh, uh, it's not nothing very new on uh, when we speak about Russia, when we see to, to the history of Russia. Uh, Tuchev uh, said some <laughs> centuries ago, umom Rasii ne panet. Uh, and uh, maybe, uh, of course, we are trying here to understand what does uh, Russia means. Maybe that just kleptocratic, brutal uh, regime, which we, the West, can, uh, uh, can overcome because we are stronger and don't be afraid. Let's go forward. That is important. Thanks a lot, Rasa. And now, yeah, concluding remarks. James, would you like to jump in? No? Oh, absolutely not, Andreas. Just to thank you very much again. I'm sure we'll be revisiting this next year. I mean, it's 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 pretty critical right now, but I, I very much appreciate your cooperation and, and your um, your platform. Thank you. Thanks a lot, James. And my my you know, two just two comments. I will try to be very brief. First of all, really, you know, uh, 
we 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 are you know we are not just uh, watching what Kremlin is doing, but uh, we should remember that uh, exactly during those days, it's 30 years anniversary when Russian Empire formally collapsed in Belovesh uh, Forest. We we mentioned that in our in our plenary recently, but that's also the reason why we together with uh, Bernard Guetta, member for the Parliament from from Paris. Uh, and uh, Vladimir Shimoshevich, former Prime Minister of Poland, uh, also a member of, uh, of European Parliament, uh, we wrote a letter or address to Russian people, you know, saying in a very simple way that we understand that you are still, you know, living through this post-imperial, you know, period of all the, you know, psychological troubles, nostalgies, and so on. Slowly they are, you know, uh, going out as it was in France or some other former empires. And that is why I see really why Putin is uh, becoming so desperate. If I would be Putin, that's nightmare scenario now, I would see very clearly what are historical tendencies. First of all, this post-imperial, you know, uh, syndrome, post-imperial period, is temporary. It, it goes to, to the end. I don't know when it will happen in Russia, but at least I do not see for time being that all those you know, aggressive uh, uh, behavior of, of Putin trying to show that he is going again for rebuilding empires, that it's, it, it, it gives him uh, a lot of popularity. It's opposite. Popularity is going down. Second, really, you know, if I would be Putin again, what I would be afraid that democratization is spreading in the former, you know, in the territory of former Soviet Union. And, uh, and you know, events in Belarus from last year, I think it's such a big threat to Putin that, you know, uh, really uh, we see all that desperation, what, what he is doing both inside and outside. And the last point, if I would be Putin, I would become very much worried about what Europe is doing with climate change, with Green Deal and so on and so on. And if Green Deals will be, you know, implemented as it is now, you know, put by commission with all the numbers, which will mean that in, in, in you know, in 12 or, or, or 15 years time, uh, gas imports from Russia to, to Europe will diminish by 75%. I would be, you know, if I would be Putin, I would become very much worried about that. And when you are starting to feel that you are becoming weaker, what are you trying to do then? You know, you maybe you can, you know, go, you, you can have a wish to go for fight as quickly as possible till you are able to fight. That is, of course, dangerous. That desperation is dangerous. But I, at least in my view, I see more and more features. I am not a psychologist, but, you know, with some kind of political experience that Putin really is becoming nervous. And that is what we are facing. So, Sorry for too long conclusions. Thanks a lot for very interesting, you know, debate for a very interesting paper. Thanks a lot to Chatham House and to James and to and to and to you know uh, and to uh, I forgot the name even you know for Kai <laughs> Giles. You know, uh, really brilliant, brilliant paper. As I said, you know, I was envying. So we hope to see new papers. We are ready always to discuss. And now I am concluding with really all, all the best wishes for Merry Christmas and, and, and Happy New Year and so on and so on. So thanks a lot to everybody. Thank Merry you. Christmas. Yeah. yeah, Merry Christmas to everyone. Thanks.